Welcome to the Therapy Show Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard. In each episode, I interview a seasoned and knowledgeable talk therapist from the counseling world to glean valuable insights, techniques, and tools that you can apply to your practice and your life. And if you're considering a career in the counseling field or just want to hear about what it's like to be a talk therapist, then this is the podcast for you. Michelle Page received her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from the University of Connecticut and her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Creighton University. She then went on to complete a pharmacy residency at Group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound in Seattle, Washington, and also became board certified in geriatric pharmacy. In addition, she has completed several certification programs, including diabetes, smoking cessation, and medication management. It was her work in geriatrics where she began to become disillusioned with the allopathic medical model and started exploring lifestyle medicine and alternative healing modalities beyond herbs and supplements. This journey led her to the functional medicine model and its approach to treating the dis-ease found in the body. As a lifelong learner, Dr. Page has a very diverse knowledge base and skill set that includes personal training, nutrition consulting, and success coaching, all of which she utilizes as the founder of the Unbreakable Moms, a supportive community that connects moms with resources and a podcast along with it, titled the same thing, Unbreakable Moms. Dr. Page is currently working on her first book about the influence of the gut-brain connection on mood, which will be published in spring of 2020. And I knew she was the perfect person to have on the show today to talk about gut health and mental health. In today's episode, Michelle is going to cover four main objectives, which we will cover as soon as we dive into the episode. But I wanted to share that if you like this episode and you want to receive continuing education credit for it, all you need to do is head to the pod course page, click on buy pod course, submit payment. By the way, did you know you can get this very first one for free? Yep, just go to my homepage on my website, submit your email, and I'll send you over a code for a free pod course. So if you like this one, you could use your free your free pod course for this uh, continuing education contact hour. How awesome is that, right? We hope you guys enjoy this episode, and we'll see you on the inside of the show. Well, hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Therapy Show. My name is Lisa Mustard, and once again, I am excited to have my guest. On for this episode, this is going to be a really cool and interesting conversation about gut health and mental health. And my guest today, I'm going to let her share her credentials and all the cool things that she does, but she's my friend, Michelle Page, and we've known each other for quite a number of years. And I'm just so glad to have her in my back pocket because she is just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to, I mean, all kinds of things, really. So welcome to the show, Michelle. I'm super excited to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to be here and share with your audience a little bit about, you know, some gut health issues and how it relates to mental health. Yeah, definitely. And it's something that I know you're really passionate about is health and wellness and living a healthy lifestyle. Can you share with the listeners a little bit about your background and what it is that you do? Because you do a number of things and I want to make sure they get a really broad picture of who you are and what you do. (laughs) Sure. Um, You could basically say that I have a really bad case of squirrel syndrome because of (laughs) (laughs) everything's very bright and shiny to me. But I am a pharmacist by traditional training and by profession, went through traditional pharmacy school, went on to the graduate level to get my doctorate and residency and all that fun stuff that a traditional pharmacist will do. But I actually spent about 20 years in long-term care working with the geriatric patient population and really seeing all of their health issues. And what I came to realize is that many of these chronic illnesses were really the result of lifestyle choices that they made at younger ages. And I began this journey of lifestyle medicine and looking at how we can prevent a lot of those chronic illnesses based on better choices when we're younger. So that means diet and exercise, the thing that most people think about when they think of being healthy. But during that journey, I also became interested in alternative healing, alternative modalities of treatments besides medications, which led me down this whole pathway of natural medicine and herbs and supplements. And then that led me into more holistic areas of homeopathy and essential oils and 
I don't know, just a whole bunch of anything that you can consider of alternative meditation, sound healing, energy medicine, all of that fun stuff. So yeah. when I say I have a very eclectic background and, and base that I draw from, it's because I'm always finding this new thing that I think is really fascinating. And so I'm learning about it. Yeah. And along the way, I've also ventured into working with moms of teenagers and providing support systems for them and addressing their issues. Being a mom myself of teenage girls, I completely understand a lot of the issues that can pop up with them and using, you know, alternative healing modalities to kind of address some of their issues with health. Also just the support of different therapists and anger management and behavioral issues that go along with that too. Yeah. Wow. You do so much. You're so, you're so multi-passionate. I love it. And we, <laughs> you and I are like, I wish we lived near each other. Cause you're, I'm in South Carolina and you're in Connecticut, right? I always want Correct. to say New Hampshire, but I know you're in Connecticut. I just wish we lived closer. Cause I know we'd be hanging out all the time and like talking about so much stuff, but you are one of my great and dear friends that I've known for, for many years. And so I want to just kind of share that you're so knowledgeable in so many different areas. And it's like, you know, I go to Michelle a good bit when I'm like curious about something or she'll just pop up and say, Hey, have you thought about this? Or, Hey, what do you know about this? <laughs> so it's like, this, it's really fun to have you in my life. So I'm grateful that you're here. And so what are you doing today? Like currently, what is it that you're most excited about with your work? Well, I'm in kind of at an interesting place right now with my work in general. I still work part-time as a pharmacist, but I work in a medical marijuana dispensary. So in the state of Connecticut, we have a pharmacy model for our dispensaries. So it's set up in that a pharmacist must be on hand in the building, in the store, whenever the, the dispensary is open. So I've really kind of been able to use a lot of my knowledge of integrative medicine, alternative medicine in that area of, you know, working with patients. So that's one aspect of what I'm doing these days. I'm also working, writing a book specifically on gut health and um, mood disorders and being happy. So it's a perfect timing that you've asked me to, to come here and speak with everybody. Awesome. And then I'm also running a group called the Unbreakable Moms, yeah. again, supporting moms of teenage daughters um, through coaching and just providing resources and, and references for them. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm doing right now, but mostly just, yeah. And you, have, and you also have a podcast. Yes, I do. <laughs> it's part of the Unbreakable Moms. It's called the Unbreakable Moms podcast, where you get to hear all of the different resources that I found that can support moms. It's awesome. I love your show. It's so good. And it's one of the first places I like to point my mom friends to when they're dealing with, you know, daughter stuff or kids stuff. So thank you for, for doing that show and for providing so much value. It's great. Okay. So let's talk about our objectives for today. So everybody knows what we're going to cover. I'm just going to read them to you because I want to be legit with what we're going to be sharing. So after listening to this program today, you will be able to describe the primary difference in the approach to mental health between allopathic and functional medicine. That's number one. Number two, be able to name at least two prescription medications that are used for a dual diagnosis of depression and anxiety. Number three, describe the role of the autonomic nervous system, ANS, in mental health. And then lastly, describe the biological effects of having a leaky gut as it relates to mental health. So a lot of the times when therapists have a new client, you know, we often were screening for medications and, and what are our clients taking? Have they had a physical recently? What does their doctor say? So we are kind of on the lookout for medical issues that are going to impact mental and emotional health. So I think this is going to be really helpful for us to kind of dig a little bit deeper, go into more of a deeper dive as on this topic. Okay, so number one, describe the primary difference in the approach to mental health between allopathic medicine and functional medicine. Yeah, so I mean, 
obviously I don't need to really describe allopathic medicine. It's the medical model that most of us are familiar with and working in. Mm -hmm. You know, we go to the doctor when something's wrong, they evaluate us, do different tests, assessments, and then they come up with a treatment plan, which usually involves medication, but not always. Mm -hmm. And that's the traditional allopathic way of treating disease within our bodies. Functional medicine is a newer branch of medicine that some of you may have heard about, and it really looks at treating illnesses at the root cause. So digging down and figuring out what's out of whack within the body. If you can think of a tree and the symptoms that people are expressing are the branches of the tree. What allopathic medicine is it addresses those branches with the Band-Aid approach. Functional medicine goes down deep in the roots of the tree and looks at what's really underlying everything. What's out of balance? How can we make this correction to the body at the root level so that that the body can then better equip itself to rebalance and fix itself because our bodies are magical, really. They are so complex and they innately know how to maintain homeostasis within itself But sometimes in allopathic medicine, we forget about that. And it's just so much easier to apply that Band-Aid approach. Yeah, that's a really good way of describing the two. I I like how you use the tree analogy. And I think that as therapists, and I don't mean to stir a pot here, but a lot of the times, you know, people come to therapy and they just want to be told, "What, what do I do to fix this? And what pill can I take to make these symptoms go away? Where our role as therapists is to help people kind of really dig deep and look at the root causes and experiences that they've had in their life that have kind of kept them stuck or getting in the way of them functioning as healthy as they they could be. So I really like how you're kind of, you know, jumping into it and seeing it from both sides. As a pharmacist, what is it like to have that mindset in a medical model for you? Like How does that work, you know, with your role? Yeah, because I usually tell people that I'm an integrative pharmacist, that immediately their minds open up and realize that that I kind of approach things a little bit differently. Um, Many of the people that I work with and meet, they always say, you know, oh, I hate taking medication. And so it allows me to then kind of dive into, well, That's good because there are a lot of options besides taking medications, even like herbs that you could take or supplements could really still be considered medication until you really start digging a little bit deeper and figure out what's really going on within the body at that root level. So it's just a whole different way of approaching, you know, illnesses and even mental health illnesses. So you know, overall, the topic is gut health and mental health. It's kind of, I hear it a lot on the street, (laughs) on the street, you know, people just kind of saying that, um, I know there's research on it, but you know, your gut health really does play a role in your emotional and mental health. Can you talk about that? Kind of give some background in that or, or, and, and share with the listeners, like, how do they play a role with each other? Yeah. So it gets very complex and I try to break it into chunks and address them separately Mm -hmm. so that it's easier to comprehend. But really it all kind of meshes together as does everything in our body. Nothing works as a silo, which is again, the approach of functional medicine is that you don't look at just the heart and the cardiovascular system. You look at all of the pieces that feed into that and what all the pieces that the cardiovascular system also feeds into. Mm -hmm. So when I look at gut health and mental health, one of the first things I want people to understand is that connection with the autonomic nervous system. So most of us are familiar with the central nervous system. And a component of that is the autonomic nervous system as well as the sympathetic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the one that basically is automatic. We don't think about the things that happen. Our nervous system just knows what to do, like blinking. We don't think about blinking. Our nervous system just knows, let's close our eyes every few seconds to kind of clear the debris that might be on our eyes and lubricate it. 
the sympathetic nervous system is associated more with the fight or flight type responses, things to keep things going and, and that part of the nervous system. But we're going to focus here on the gut. So the autonomic nervous system, part of that innervates into our gut, into our intestinal digestive tract. So that whole nervous system area that's in our digestive tract is called the enteric nervous system. And it connects to our central nervous system via the vagus nerve. I'm sure many of your therapists are familiar with the vagus nerve. I know that there's the polyvagal theory out there. Mm -hmm. So this is not something new, I'm, I'm sure, for most of your listeners. Mm -hmm. And because that vagus nerve and that autonomic nervous system is bi-directional, that's the connection between the gut and the brain. Those messages that our brain has and those neurochemicals from the brain get transferred down into the gut system and says, you know, we need this, we need that, and vice versa. There could be things going on in the gut that sends messages back up to the brain saying, well, because of this going on in our gut, I now feel like this. I now feel sad. I now feel depressed. I now feel anxious, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's wow. kind of like a very high level, very simplistic way of looking at it. Yeah, but I like that. I need simple. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I mean, that definitely helps me visualize what's going on. So what would be some common issues of gut health? Like what messes up your gut or what would uh, impact your gut for it not to be healthy? Well, there's a lot of talk these days about the gut um, microbiome, meaning the bacteria, the good bacteria that live in our gut. Now we're all aware of this. We've all been on antibiotics where we go to the doctor and the doctor says, here's your antibiotic, you know, eat some yogurt to go with it. So you don't get some side effects because the antibiotics have killed off the, the good bacteria in your gut. So the health of our, our gut, the microbiome is really critical in maintaining our overall health. And I'll get to the reason why of that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But there's so much going on at play with in the bacteria that live in our gut. There's the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, and maintaining that balance is, is a, a key element. So we can also talk about candida and the overgrowth of that. That's a yeast infection, a, a fungus that can get overly grown in our gut to cause an imbalance. Or of course, we could just be killing all of the good bacteria that's in our gut because we're over ambitious in some of our antibiotics that we're taking. So if you're somebody who's maybe on an antibiotic for acne and poor skin, then you know, you're killing your gut bacteria in the meantime, again, upsetting the balance of the good and the bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. Now, the other aspect of gut health is something called leaky gut syndrome. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that phrase. I know it's gaining momentum and more people are aware of it, but it's a collection of different symptoms. And leaky gut at a very simplistic level is when your gut starts leaking the contents that are supposed to stay in the gut into the rest of your body. So the way I like to explain it is that the inside of our gut is actually the outside of our body. And the lining of our gut, all the way from our mouth, all the way down through the esophagus, into the stomach, into the small intestines, large intestines, and out, that is a hole. If you think of a donut, it's the hole. So the foods that we eat, the things that we consume are meant to stay in the center, are meant to stay in the outside of our body. Mm -hmm. And for various reasons, sometimes that lining, that wall that's supposed to keep those foreign objects in the outside of our body from getting in can start leaking. There can get little holes in it so that what's supposed to stay on the outside of our body gets pulled inside our body and our body starts reacting to it. Mm -hmm. And it reacts to it in the way it would any foreign body. It attacks it because it wants to get rid of it. Again, our body is smart. It naturally wants to maintain homeostasis. And so it sends out all of these signals in the body to send the inflammation, to send the, you know, activate the immune system and, and things like that to get it back into balance. Okay. So how, what are some signs and symptoms that somebody might have if they're experiencing leaky gut? The one that often comes up is lethargy tiredness, fatigue. It's a very 
nondescript yeah. <laughs> symptom, mm-hmm. which makes it so hard. And people just think, oh, it's because I'm busy. You know, I'm working. I'm a mom. I've got this going on. I, you know, there's so much in life. I just need to rest more, which in and of itself is a stress that can cause an upset and an imbalance in our hormones normally. Mm-hmm. But that's a primary indicator is just that I'm, I'm just not feeling my best because I'm tired. Maybe my thinking isn't clear, you know, so it's what we call the brain fog. And we all know what that feels like when we're just, our brain just isn't working. And often we laugh it off and we say, I just haven't had my cup of coffee yet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need a little energy kick, but sometimes there's really something a lot deeper that needs to be addressed. Um, And in this case, we're talking about the gut. Okay. So is that something that we need to be taking into consideration if somebody presents as a client, they discuss that. They might say, I'm, I feel like I've been in a fog recently or my energy's been really low. So a lot of the times we have to dig deeper. We have to ask more questions. What would be another question that we could ask as a therapist to kind of get a sense of, is this more than just, you know, you do need an extra cup of coffee or you are just tired this week or, you know, because a lot of times people will present um, and that's one symptom of depression is people saying that is that they, they are just tired. They have a hard time getting out of bed. They feel like they're in a fog. So what else should we ask next? Like what would be the next thing to kind of poke around for? I think, and this may seem like it's outside of your scope of practice, but the next question that comes to my mind to ask would be, what's your diet like? What do oh, you no. eat? We ask that. <laughs> That's not outside. You know, I I will tell you that it's becoming more and more important that as therapists, we ask about nutrition. So go for it. Tell us more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because of the leaky gut syndrome mm-hmm. that so many people have because of what we are now learning about the gut. And if any of your listeners are familiar with Dr. Kelly Brogan, all of her work is centered around this. She's a board certified psychiatrist who has actually helped to put most of her patients' depression in remission by looking at their diet and healing their gut. Mm -hmm. And so starting there is really a good way to kind of address it at a bigger scale. It's not a Band-Aid approach. And that's, I think, the hardest part about functional medicine and that people have. It's not traditional medicine. There's not just a drug that you take every day and it'll fix the problem. We're talking about lifestyle modification. It's hard. hard. (laughs) It's not easy, but the long-term benefits are substantially greater than just taking a pill. So asking about diet and then knowing, you know, what are the main flags of a poor diet that can cause leaky guts, that can cause inflammation in the body is another pathway of discussion that you can have. So, you know, what are the main food groups that we're looking at? And I'm sure you all know what they are because they're in, you know, the common press these days. There's gluten. You know, it's not just for people that have celiac disease, but most of us have an allergic reaction to gluten, whether or not we realize it or not. It's just that we've inundated our body with it. We've just learned to live with it. So gluten's a main irritant of and cause of leaky gut syndrome. Uh, Dairy is another big one that can cause irritation because we're allergic to it. Most of us don't drink organic cow's milk. You know, we don't look at for all of those key words where, you know, for grass fed and things pasture raised. So we're getting chemicals in that cow's milk that we're consuming that is causing an allergic reaction within us. And again, causing inflammation, creating a leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sugar is another one. We know about the addictive properties of sugar. It hits that dopamine in our brain and makes, you know, those reward centers. We love it. We crave it, but it's so bad for us. <laughs> Again, causing inflammation in, in our bodies. And so just even starting at those levels and looking at a patient's diet mm-hmm. of, you know, how much gluten are they consuming? How much dairy, how much sugar, and then starting to chip away at it and trying to pull back and eliminate those things from a person's diet can really start helping them heal, improve their mood and get rid of a lot of that lethargy, that brain fog and what they're feeling are of depression that they might be experiencing. 
Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's incredible to, to think that gluten and dairy, you know, can cause these issues in your body. And then, you know, how do they show up was the question I was going to ask. And I, I have an idea, but if somebody were to have a gluten, would you call it intolerance or dairy intolerance? What would that look like? And that's the hardest part. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I, I know, right. Because it, it, it's so subtle. Mm -hmm. Because most of us grew up eating gluten and we don't even realize where it's found. I mean, the obvious places are bread and pasta, mm -hmm. but there can be other hidden areas of gluten that we may not even realize, you know, mm -hmm. that it's hiding in there. Same with the sugar, same with the dairy. We've been consuming it our entire lives. So we don't know what life is like without it. And as progress has been made in the farming industry, our exposure to gluten and pesticides and antibiotics and chemicals has increased over the years, which is mm -hmm. not the healthiest thing, but that's the, unfortunately, the age that we live in. So we need to become much more conscientious about what we're consuming. So just looking at those aspects and knowing that whatever dis-ease that you're feeling within your body, start looking at how much you're consuming of gluten, how much sugar are you consuming? How much cow's milk are you consuming? Yes, it's hard to eliminate cheese. I hear that from so many people. It's the hardest thing to give up is cheese because we all crave it. And I got to tell you, vegan cheese is just not the same. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it, I can't even, I've never had it. I don't know. I just can't do it. <laughs> But I hear you. It doesn't melt. I'm told it doesn't melt right. So yes. people say it doesn't melt. So I wanted to share that one of our, our daughters has a dairy intolerance. And we honestly didn't, we didn't realize it or know it. But she, as a baby, always was dealing with eczema and always seemed to have an allergy issue. Like she always seemed congested. And we finally, you know, along with our pediatrician, kind of took some foods away. And we realized it was the milk that was really causing her eczema to flare. And she's outgrown a good bit of it. But I do notice that certain foods will like yogurt will bring it on quicker than ice cream or cheese. It's wild how, how that works. So we have to definitely watch, you know, dairy for her, you know, her eczema, you know, she, she is outgrowing it somewhat. So, and I know some people never do. So it's, there's a difference there, but I also know that for my husband, he grew up drinking milk a couple of years ago, he cut milk out, you know, cow's milk. And now we primarily will drink almond milk, unsweetened almond milk. So that was a big shift for him. But I don't know if he would report feeling any different. I know he dropped some weight, you know, because of the sugar in the cow's milk. Mm -hmm. And now when he has cow's milk, it's so weird for him because he's been away from it for so long. He definitely notices he feels different afterwards. I don't think there's much more to compare to, but I'm just trying to think of other things that, you know, we don't eat a lot of sugar in our home. So when we do have sugar, like a piece of cake or, you know, a donut, it definitely can, I can see a different energy in our kids. But what about sugar? Like, can you, cause I, so many people don't want to give sugar up. They think it's so hard and they don't realize that there's sugar kind of hidden in so many of the common things that we eat. I do know and have heard that, you know, it's important to, because sugar is just, oh, it can cause so many issues, so many <laughs> issues in our body. What do you think about, about that when it comes to sugar? Yeah, definitely sugar is something, again, that we're so used to consuming. And especially in our fast-paced society that we have, we're always grabbing those quick, easy meals, snacks that often have hidden chemicals and sugar in them that we don't taste as sweet, but they're in there if you really read the packaging. Mm -hmm. So usually what I tell people that are not too keen on giving up sugar is try to eliminate the added sugar, the sugars that you know are present. So if you usually have coffee and you put, you know, two tablespoons of sugar in it, eliminate that. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> start there, start with the obvious areas of sugar and the same thing with dairy, you know, start with the obvious areas of eliminating them mm -hmm. and see how you're feeling. You may notice that your body is starting to, to respond a little bit differently. You know, it's not just always about the symptoms that you're feeling, but sometimes when you're kind of 
suspecting that you may have an intolerance to gluten or dairy. There are different tests that food tests that can be done. Some of them you can do at home. They're usually sometimes a cheek swab, or you can go to a naturopath and other specialists that can do more in-depth testing for you that are more specific for specific proteins or genetic testing and things like that, that can help guide you also. But just having this idea that these things could be causing it. And actually, I was just talking with a friend of mine whose husband, he's now 50 something years old, never realized he had a dairy intolerance and he was gaining weight, gaining weight, and they couldn't figure out why. And she's a health coach. And so they ate healthy food and they decided to do some testing and realized that he's allergic to dairy. So they eliminated it all forms of dairy from his diet. And within, I think it was, he, she said about six weeks, he just automatically dropped tons of weight. You can mm-hmm. see it in his face. You can obviously see it in the rest of his body that it just, it was gone because he had so much inflammation in his body mm-hmm. that was causing him to retain all of that weight. And I think that's the culprit really of all of the, what we're talking about here is the inflammation being caused in your body because of your gut health, because of the leaky gut, because your microbiome is not balanced. It's that inflammation being created in your body that's causing that disruption and therefore causing you not to feel as good as you want to, to have those depressive moods and feeling blue and anxiety because your neurochemicals, your those neurotransmitters are just not in balance the way they need to be. Right. What would be some natural ways to help heal your gut? Well, the first thing is obviously looking at the diet because I, I try to do that the first as the first step instead of adding things in. Right, but once right. you've eliminated that, you can also start adding in a supplement. And the first go-to supplement is a, a probiotic, mm-hmm. you know, to replenish the good, healthy bacteria into your gut so that it can start producing the, the neurotransmitters that are produced in the gut. And for those of you that don't know, about 50% of our serotonin is produced in the gut. Same with dopamine, I think has over half of it or about half of it is produced through the gut. Um, There's gut bacteria that can actually play a role in, in all of that too. So it's not just in the brain that these neurotransmitters are being created. It's also in our gut, again, which points to the fact that we need to really start looking closer at what does our gut health really look like? Yeah, I really like that. It's so important. (laughs) So important that we look at those neurotransmitters are created in our gut. It's our responsibility to take care of our gut. You know, we have to, we have to do the right thing. And I do know that for a lot of people, it is hard. Change is hard. You know, they don't want to give up certain foods. They feel like they don't have the support at home for people to, to get on board with them. So as a therapist, you know, part of our job would be to support them in that and to help them process it and to help them figure out how they want to make a plan for that, how they can have conversations with their support system about what it is that they need to be in a healthier place. And that can be a cause of so many other things that come bubbling up for folks when we start talking about that. So this is, it's interesting to me how systemic it is. They present perhaps with symptoms of depression. We start asking questions. We find out about their nutrition and their diet. Maybe they're experiencing, you know, some inflammation in their bodies. I'm curious, what do you think when somebody presents with some of these symptoms at, you know, doctor's office, what do you think the prescription or the conversation is nowadays? I mean, I know you don't, you know, know across the board what that looks like, but what would you, what do you think's going on at doctor's offices? I think what's going on is just, you know, based on my own personal experience is you, you know, tell the doctor, this is what's going on. They say, okay, well, let's, let's do some lab work and make sure that nothing's going on, you know, in your blood, that's obvious and we're Mm -hmm. not missing anything. So they do, you know, your traditional CBC with diff workup, check all of your, your TSH and things like that. And then they, you come back, everything's normal. And they say, okay, well, let's, let's start you on a very low dose of a mild antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) So they immediately go for the medications. Now, 
options for medications are, there's so many of them. Most physicians reach for the newer class, which are traditionally the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. So we're talking about things like Paxil, paroxetine, Zoloft, sertraline. There's also um, Lexapro, escitalopram. So there's many different medications in this one class. I mean, traditionally, if you have older patients that you're working with, they may be on some of the older antidepressants that the doctor has prescribed based on these symptoms, things like the tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline that's still commonly used, especially in our elderly elderly patients that are, don't want to give up the drug that works. Oh, okay. Good to know. <laughs> You know, but there's, you know, that's the first thing that most physicians that I've seen, that's how they address the problem of, you know, feeling depressed and not having the energy and not feeling like themselves. They think, oh, this person has depression because we did, I don't know what it's like now in, you know, your practice, but I know we did go through a period, at least in long-term care, where we we were more sensitive to the underdiagnosis of depression in the elderly. Mm -hmm. So at that point, everybody was being screened for depression and then therefore started on some kind of antidepressant medication. Wow. So that was the go-to. So they would screen them and then they would put them on a medication and possibly instead of other things first. Correct. And I think that's true just even for, you know, people that are still young and healthy and living at home, you know, no matter how old you are, even, you know, teenagers now, so many more teenagers and preteens are being started on antidepressants because they're depressed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, that's just sets up a whole cascade of other issues because of the side effects that are, you know, due to medications in and of themselves. And as I'm sure most of your, your listening audience knows with SSRIs, the big black box warning is may cause suicide. Yeah, I know. Um, Suicidal ideation. It's much more common, you know, that that's Mm -hmm. kind of a big risk that you're taking for somebody who just doesn't feel right when you could say, let's eliminate gluten. Right. Right. I know. And, you know, I think that, and I'm just going to kind of go off here as a side, because I, you know, I'm a mom, you're a mom. And if that was my child, I would personally be looking at other things to work on before being okay with giving an antidepressant, especially for middle schooler or young high school student. I just feel like that's, I don't know. What do you think? I definitely agree. It's just, it's hard, especially if you're talking about high school age, Mm -hmm. because they have so much more dependence. You don't always pack their lunch and you don't know what, you know, the access that they have to the vending machines. And when they're out with their friends, you can't control what they consume. Mm -hmm. Um, And it just gets worse when they go off to college because then, you know, they do whatever they want anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So well, and I know, I mean, you and I are similar in our approach to health and wellness and eating. So, you know, for, and I'll just share personally at home, we are very mindful of teaching the girls healthy eating and balance and, you know, pay attention to how you feel after you eat that ice cream bar versus how you feel after you have a clementine. And so they might be tired of me saying that, but it it's like, I'm just trying to make them aware of how their body reacts and responds and feels because we're so out of touch with our own bodies sometimes, you know, I, so that's, that's how I like to do it at home. What do you, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I've never used quite that line of questioning (laughs) of how does your body feel after you eat, you know, a clementine versus, you know, that candy bar. Um, (laughs) Please don't get me wrong. The girls look at me like I'm crazy sometimes. They're like, um, it tastes yummy. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I know. I just want you to be aware of that if you feel like you're going to crash in a few minutes or an hour, you know, just what sugar does to your body. So I don't want y'all to think like we're over here. <laughs> <laughs> and they answer me like so patiently and kindly. No, they roll their eyes and giggle. And we're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, okay. So yeah, so I don't think that it looks like that by any means. Yeah, we're, we're in our family. Our discussions usually center more on the eighty twenty rule. Yeah, you know, let's let's make the right healthy choices eighty percent of the time, and don't worry about the other twenty. Right? Because yeah. we, I mean, we're a foodie family. We love food. Yeah, <laughs> we love to eat. So we're meant to enjoy. It. And yes, there are 
ways that you can prepare very healthy food, vegan even, and gluten-free that are very tasty. Yeah. But until you get to that point of where, how you know how to prepare it, you're here like, I don't know mm. about that. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's just a matter of also changing your taste buds mm-hmm. to become accustomed to not having so much sugar, to not craving the cheese all the time right. um, when it's in front of you. So, you know, it, it, it's a process and it's harder, but like yeah. you said, you know, as moms, we need to start having those conversations with our kids when they're, they're younger, instead of just doing it all for them and not giving them the other options, because as they age, they are going to have other options presented to them. And you're not going to be around to pack their lunch and give them breakfast and dinner every day. Right, right. And that And let me just say as a therapist, that creates a whole other host of issues for them if we're doing that when they're in their teens. And oh yeah, and I've seen those people, they show up on our couches. No, I'm just, I'm just having some fun. You guys, y'all know I like to, we got to have a little fun in what we do. Yeah, this is really helpful. So let's talk a little bit. I know. Okay. So we talked about two, one prescription, the SSRIs, correct? Correct. And then what would be the other prescription? medication that you were referring to when you said name two? Yeah. So, I mean, the SSRI class, I mean, within that class, those are the ones that are usually used for that dual diagnosis of depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. There are newer agents out there like the SNRIs, Cymbalta is one that is very commonly used these days to that does um, address both issues of depression and anxiety. So depending on, you know, who the prescriber is, what their comfort level is, most, I'll call them pediatricians and general practitioners, internal medicine, they reach for the SSRIs. That's the ones that they know. They get a little weary about using something like an SNRI to treat their patients because I think it's just comfort level. You know, when you talk about psychiatrists and psych APRNs, you know, their comfort level is a little different about what they're prescribing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's other agents obviously out there that are considered to be antidepressants or anxiolytics, but they don't usually have that same dual crossover diagnosis in in terms of prescribing habits. Okay. And so would those medications mess with your gut health? The medications themselves don't directly mess with your gut health. Mm -hmm. There's no direct interaction. Can I just say it that way? However, I will say that in formulating medications, there are inactive ingredients. So we're talking about lactose, a sugar. (laughs) Okay. That's often used as a binder in the tablets. So again, it's those ways that sugar enters into our system that we don't realize are there. Okay. So while there's no direct interaction interfering with our gut health, you know, when we're taking medications, we're taking in foreign substances, we're taking in chemicals in a way that is not natural and normal to our body. Our body will make it so that it can use it the way it's meant to be, but its introduction is not a natural form. I gotcha. I gotcha. So it could be double-edged sword for some people. Okay. That would make sense. Hmm. So, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so it's not like medications are bad and that there's, there's definitely a role for them. You know, when you're talking about some of the more like somebody who's got major depressive disorder, You're not going to say, oh, go eliminate gluten and sugar and dairy and you'll be fine. (laughs) Right. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. You know, that's not quite what what I'm saying here. But there there is a role for them. They're not bad. They definitely have a place in treatment and therapy. But there's a deeper and more foundational level that needs to be looked at that can actually provide healing for the whole body. When you treat and heal your gut, you'll notice that so many other ailments and discomfort within your body disappear. Yeah. The obvious one is anybody who's a uh, borderline diabetic. That seems to go away when you start, you know, getting healthier, making healthier choices. Right, right. You That's know, so there's so many other issues. Any of the autoimmune diseases. I mean, if you read any of the works from Dr. Terry Walls, who healed herself of multiple sclerosis because she changed up her diet, she healed her gut, and now she's been 
disease free for many, many years, or, you know, Dr. Amy Myers, who healed her gut, and she healed her Hashimoto's. So Uh there's, there's so many other issues about um, the diseases and chronic illnesses that we have in our bodies that we don't think about are related to our gut. But science is now starting to show that there is really an underlying fundamental issue that related to gut health that's causing inflammation in our bodies. And there are actually, I meant to say this before when I was referring to Dr. Kelly Brogan, I was reading on her website, there's actually been um, studies now that show markers in patients that are clinically depressed that show elevated markers of inflammation in their bodies. And they're recognizing this, this relationship now, this cause and effect of high inflammation, depression. Yeah. Um, so once they decrease the inflammation in the body, the depression, the, the depression seems to, I won't say disappear, but deescalate. Uh huh. And I want to ask you, as I just talk about that, I want to talk to you about alcohol mm. and gut health and mental health. What are your, when I say that, <laughs> what comes to mind for you? I'm just curious. <laughs> What comes, my automatic reaction is, but I love wine. (laughs) Yeah, me too. And, you know, I ask that question because I know a lot of women who use wine as stress relief and as a way to, and it's kind of like this, it's kind of society's, you know, it's like this, you see memes about it, you know, you see t-shirts about it and, you know, mama hasn't had her wine yet. So blah, 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 you know, and I just, I understand that wine can can help like, you know, help with your stress. But when it becomes the thing that you're turning to all the time to help with your stress, then I'm imagining we've got some inflammation and we've got some alcohol is a depressant in itself. So if you are dealing with, you know, symptoms of depression, it's not the best idea to be picking up alcohol along with it. And along with the medication for depression, you know, when doctors tell you don't drink on it, they really mean it. <laughs> so what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I think, again, it's like that applying that 80-20 rule mm-hmm. of how are you having, you know, a bottle of wine every night? Well, then we've got other dis- issues to discuss here. But, right. you know, how often are you having alcohol? I mean, I have some people that I know in my social circle circles who have a glass of wine every single night. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just something that they enjoy. It's like some people that have a cup of tea every night. Well, they have a glass of wine every night. It's part of their ritual. Mm-hmm. Well, as you said, you know, alcohol by itself, we know is a natural depressant. Mm-hmm. So if you already have depressive tendencies, and especially if you're already on antidepressant medications, you're not helping yourself at right. all. Right. Alcohol itself, we also know, just kills bacteria. Mm-hmm. So any good bacteria that you want in your gut is going to be killed off. The sugar that's in the alcohol you're consuming is then feeding the bad bacteria in your gut. Right. So there's so many different angles to look at it. The bottom line is alcohol's not good for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not healthy. It's not helping you. It's It may feel good in the moment and you might enjoy the taste of it. You might enjoy the company that you're in, but you know, in the, your work as a therapist, but what, what do you, what's the real value that you're getting out of consuming the alcohol? Is it the interaction with your friends? Is it the fun? Is it the laughter? Is it the relaxation or are you trying to numb yourself? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. You, I don't mean it's funny, but my brain goes to that place of whenever, you know, kind of have this conversation. Well, you know, folks who live a long time have alcohol. It's shown that they have alcohol, you know, every day or, and I'm like, yeah, but they're having, I mean, how many ounces are they having? And then what other things are going on in their lives that, they, you know, they may not have those depressive symptoms. They may not have the inflammation. So there's a lot of things at play, but that seems to be like what I hear a lot from clients or patients is, well, you know, that's what, that's their rationalizing of their, you know, because they don't want to give it up. And it's like, they're willing to, I guess, let that be a norm in their lives. Like they've accepted it because other areas of their lives, it's, it's easier to do that than to to have hard conversations or to, you know, change their lifestyle. So there's a lot that goes on in, you know, when it comes to, (laughs) I mean, just everything, but 
when it comes to gut health and mental health and changing your diet and, you know, taking responsibility for healing yourself, um, I, I really, and I'm sure folks listening are probably nodding their head thinking of like one or two clients that they're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds like so-and-so. And we have to just, you know, as therapists, we accept our, our patients or clients where they are, where they come to us. And we have to assess, are you okay living your life like this? Because, you know, if you are, then okay. But if not, then how do you want to change moving forward? And it's, it's sometimes we want them to be on a healthier path than they are ready for. Um, I'm just kind of sharing my own like process right now with you, but then I imagine if for as, as a pharmacist, you kind of go through that a little bit too. Yeah. I mean, definitely I mean, people as a pharmacist, people just want the quick fix. Yeah. That's the bottom line. They're not willing to go through the whole process that it takes to really fix everything at a root level. It's the, it's the lifestyle modifications and behavior changes that need to really occur. I mean, we were talking, you know, focusing here on gut health, but the other aspect of that is just stress relief through meditation and slowing down and taking care of yourself and relaxing and allowing its bo the body the time to restore itself naturally yeah. instead of constantly being bombarded with stresses that we may not consider stresses, but that are upsetting that um, homeostasis within. Yeah. Yeah. I like how you say that. I think that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it because that, you know, there's a push I guess, depending on how you are in private practice, if you are paneled with insurance boards, you know, sometimes you only get a certain amount of sessions with a client and you have to help them as quickly as the insurance is going to pay you <laughs> for per session. So sometimes it is, you know, people want quick fix. They come in and they just want to feel better. Tell me what to do to feel better. And, you know, they don't, they don't want to address the root. They don't. And sometimes, what is that saying? The fear of changing is worse than no the fear of staying the same you know what i'm trying to say yes <laughs> yeah what am i trying to say like change is harder than staying the same for a lot of people even if they're pretty unhappy and with the state of their their lives well i mean as if i don't know if any of you are familiar with um the work of dr joe dispenza mm -hmm. but he you know often talks about most of us live in the familiar past yeah. because that's how our brains are wired. So that's how we function. We're comfortable there. We're not willing to go into the unknown, unfamiliar future. Yeah, totally. The fear of the unknown. Yeah. I say that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't know what the future holds and that, that can be exciting or it can be scary. I totally get that. Yeah. And, you know, I've been a therapy over the course of my life many, many times. And I will say one of the things that helps me when I have to make a change or I have to consider a lifestyle shift is I know it's going to take time. I have to be patient with myself and I know that results aren't going to happen overnight, you know, and it's like that daily consistency of action is so important. And like you said, the 80, 20 rule too is give yourself some grace. You know, we're not all perfect. We can't be, we don't want, who wants to be perfect? That's, it's a myth and it's boring, but and stressful. <laughs> it's very stressful. Yeah. And that creates a whole other, you know, can of worms of issues for a lot of people who deal with perfectionism and, and that type of personality. Yeah. Do you have any tips or ideas for therapists out there who are, you know, maybe somebody is coming into their office and they're, they're wondering, this could be a lifestyle issue. Where do you, where do you recommend they turn or, or some, some suggestions? Usually what I would suggest is that they start working with a health coach. There's all different kinds of health coaches out there. So really getting out and to know who in your area is really focused on gut health. There's actually, um, there are actually functional medicine health coaches out there that deal with addressing the root cause and lifestyle modification. So it's more than just, okay, you know, here, eat some more salads, take these supplements. It's, it's, it's much more holistic in its approach. So that's usually where I would recommend um, therapists, you know, 
have those peoples and those referrals in their back pocket. Because like you said, based on insurance, you only have a certain number of sessions. So you can maybe start leading your clients and your patients down that pathway. But you know, it's, it's a long haul work yeah. that needs to be involved there. And just reminding patients that what I tell my patients now, it's, it's very much like throwing spaghetti against the wall. You're not really sure what's going to work. You don't not, not sure what's going to stick. Right. And so you just have to give yourself that grace and that patience, figure it out. And you have to be your own detective sometimes and your own advocate for something's wrong. I need to fix it. And I know it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. I think that's really helpful. Now, do you do the health coaching? Do you do that? I do. I do. I do. Okay. I kind of wrap it into my integrative pharmacist role um, in helping people. And it's really a very holistic overview of coaching. So I, I, I don't like to say health coach because it's more than just diet and exercise. It really is a lot of mindfulness and, you know, pharmace- some pharmaceuticals or, or basically looking at the pharmaceuticals that they're on. And I'm very much a polypharmacy eliminator. So I try to like, look at what can we eliminate? um, What can be replaced maybe with some other natural remedies that may um, be more supportive for people. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different aspects that I, that I work with. That's really cool. Do you consult as well with, you know, therapists or dietitians or do you do that too? Yeah, I'm, I'm open to doing that. I have kind of done one off informal consultations. Most of the time, I don't really have formal arrangements with with people to do that only because I've never set up a brick and mortar office. Right. For people to kind of know that I'm in existence, people just kind of find me through word of mouth. You know, if they've heard me, they've had somebody else, you know, know of me. So yeah. that's primarily how I, I start working with people. Very cool. And then if you were to recommend, you know, some books or some more information out there on gut health and mental health for a therapist who's listening, who really wants to maybe take a deeper dive, what would you suggest? Definitely, I would suggest checking out Kelly Brogan. Um, I believe her website is kellybroganmd.com. And she, like I had mentioned earlier, she's a board certified psychiatrist who is now turned to functional medicine and really helped her most of her patients go into remission with their depression. And so that's like her big platform now is you can heal your depression or put it into remission by, you know, changing your diet. And this is the reason why. So that would be the first place that I would um, refer people to. There are so many other well-known um, functional medicine doctors out there. You know, Dr. Mark Hyman is another popular one. Dr. Mercola, Dr. Josh Axe. They're all have the MD credentials after them or ND credentials after them. So you know that they're coming at it from a very scientific mindset and looking at the research and what do the, you know, double blind randomized compl- placebo controlled studies show, or is it all in vivo being done in the lab in the rats? And what does that show for us? What promise is that holding for us? So those are the areas where, you know, there, there are enough household names of physicians and, and practitioners that people can find that talk more in depth about this. And then the other resource that I wanted to let people know about that I go to a lot is called Green Med Info. So you can just type it into Google. It's a great website. There's great resources there. And it's all about alternative natural healing. So some of it is might sound like woo-woo, but there's more and more science showing that the woo-woo is actually scientific. <laughs> yeah. What's the most woo-woo thing you've heard about gut health? Can you think of something? The most woo-woo is that you can heal it just by imagining it and yourself, imagining yourself healing, imagining your, imagining your gut healing, imagining how you're feeling to be totally healed and not feeling the way you're feeling and going through that process on a daily basis, multiple times a day, getting into that theta wave brain mm-hmm. state so that you're really, you, your body and your brain don't know the difference between reality and imagined. Wow. So that's the most woo-woo, but that's <laughs> neuroscience. So Yeah. Well, I mean, it's woo-woo for sure because it doesn't involve you doing anything like taking medication or eating, changing your diet. It's, it's about focusing and getting into that meditative state. Like you said, right. That's wild. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I like that, that website, Green Med Info, they, mm-hmm. they take into consideration, you know, herbs and mm-hmm. supplements, but then they also look at a lot of neuroscience and the benefits of meditation on healing the body. And then even looking at EMFs and 5G and the radiation, and that's a whole nother topic oh, of yeah. how that's bombarding our bodies and affecting our, our brain waves and causing us to be a, be more stressed out and anxious and depressed than we need to be. Yeah, that's probably a whole other podcast, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, maybe we'll come, we'll have you back and we can talk about that. Because I th- I do think that's something that we're not talking about and we're not, we're just, we're thinking, oh, more, <laughs> more data at my fingertips. How, that's a wonderful thing when really it's, people don't think about how that can affect our bodies. It's a big science experiment, right? Yes. Yes, it is. And that's the other thing. It's, it's like most chronic illnesses. I don't feel sick. So I'm not to not be sick. Right. You know, and that's how um, EMFs and 5G works in our body. We don't feel our body changing. You know, some people are developing the hypersensitivity now to radiation. And so they're having real physical symptoms and reaction to it. But for the most part, most of us are bathed in radiation constantly. Even now, you know, I'm sitting here next to my router. I'm being bathed right now in um, an EMF. So I try to do whatever I can to try to shield myself and mitigate that, that exposure. But yeah, that's a whole nother, (laughs) whole nother topic for a whole nother podcast. I know. Well, this has been just really helpful and just informational and fascinating. And you've, you've definitely opened my eyes to a lot of things. And you know, when I have uh, patients who something that I definitely want to screen for when they are talking about feeling lethargic and just kind of in a funk or in, in a, in a fog, I think that's really helpful. Do we miss any other symptoms that they might be showing? I guess I'm well, come back I'm to just, that. I try to think from your perspective, you know, mm-hmm. as a therapist, what are patients coming to you and describing mm-hmm. as symptoms? And I think those are, to me, are like the big flagships is that they're feeling depressed. So you're thinking already, you're going through your, your work up in your mind of, you know, are they depressed? Are they clinically depressed? Are they right. anxious? Do they have anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder? You know, is it PTSD? Right. And you're going through that whole workup, but yes, they might need more intensive treatment, mm-hmm. but a more basic level is what's your diet like? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's start there. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a great question. I think that's the one question that we all need to be asking. Um, and my hope is that folks listening that, you know, if this, if this doesn't open your eyes a little bit more that you'll go and do a little bit more of your own research on gut health and mental health and how it all, how it all ties in. It's, it's just fascinating. Thank you, Michelle, for being here. This has been great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Therapy Show with Lisa Mustard. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamustard.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the show. Thank you.